You know, we don't, uh, they don't do this to be praised or to be acknowledged because it's not a performance. They do it to lead us in worship. But I just want to say thanks to our worship team. I know how hard they worked to put that together. So can we just join me in saying praise God for all of them? Thank you. We, we really do. I do sound better when you play to accompany me. We praise God for your gifts and for leading us so well. Let's, let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father God, we come now to your word and we, we know because you've told us that it's living and active. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. It's able to divide our thoughts, our intentions, even to pierce our very soul. And so we ask you to speak to us in the name of Jesus, who is the living word. Amen. 16 years ago, uh, in 2002, that seems crazy, 16 years ago, I was a youth pastor here, and I went with a group from our church, a delegation, if you will, to a, a church that we supported in Samara, Russia. Uh, it, it was called the, it's called the First Transfiguration Baptist Church of Samara. Say that 10 times fast. It's a good, catchy church name, huh? But we, they're like a sister church to us, and we supported them for many years, and they were, support, they were celebrating their centennial, 100 years. They had outlasted communism, and they were having a, a citywide celebration of their 100-year anniversary, and we went as kind of a delegation to help them celebrate. A number of us went. Uh, just, it was remarkable to meet these, some of these men and women of faith and all that God had done in their families' lives. Many of them were descendants of those who had given their lives to smuggle Bibles into the country or to see that church established. One evening before the big celebration, we were in this sort of town banquet hall. Uh, the pastors of the church, a number of the elders of the church, and some of the church plant pastors that that church had planted. And Samara is down south of Moscow, a 15-hour train ride along the Volga River in the foothills of the Ural Mountains, a beautiful area. And we, that whole evening, we ate, and then we ate some more, and then after we'd eaten some more, we ate some more, and we did, did, sang songs, and um, really just was an amazing time. And most of it was in Russian, but I had a translator there with me who would tell me bits and pieces of what was being said. Then there was this prayer time, and it's not like prayer time around here where it's like just a way of saying, let's close the meeting, amen. It was this long, extended time of prayer. It was all in Russian, and I didn't know what they were saying, but it sounded very spiritual. And then uh, you'll see an image here of this banquet hall. This is see that young guy at the end in the blue shirt. That's me. Can you believe that? Uh, this is part of our, our, our gathering. And so when we'd finished, Pastor Victor, who was a senior pastor of the church, prayed uh, in English for me. Like all of a sudden, all this Russian praying for like an hour, he, he prays for, in English for me. And I, I can remember vividly today what that felt like, what his prayer for me felt like. And what I mean is... Um, you ever have experience where, you, like, you've been somewhere and it's, uh, and it's just an amazing experience, either spiritually or otherwise, and you come home and you try to explain it to somebody that you love, but you just can't find the words to put that, you can't quite explain what it was like. I sort of feel that way about, about this text and about that experience. It was just overwhelming to me. I had this tangible sense of the presence of God in that room. I mean, hairs on my arm standing up, goosebumps, like, just, I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit in the room as he prayed. And I... I sensed from his words that this man knew the love of God in a way that I really didn't. We're both pastors. We're both Christians for many years. But I just had this sense, like, I just had this longing. I want to know God the way he knows God. Because the way he prayed was saying something, right, about his relationship with the one to whom he prayed. And it was so compelling to me. I still think about that. And I thought about that as I came to this text. Because when I read through this text in, in Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, I, I had the same kind of feeling, this longing for what Paul prays for, to experience what he prays for. So let's, let's read it together. Ephesians 3, I'll read verses 14 through 21. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church 
and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs> Only kidding, not even close. <laughs> but I did feel that way. I feel like, how do, you, how do you preach about this prayer? It's so, you could do a lot worse, friends. In fact, I would just encourage you, you know, this week, turn off all the podcasts, turn off Sports Talk Radio, which is a hard thing for me, and just play this prayer on repeat in your car as you drive. Every day this week. Just let the, that prayer of Paul for us wash over your life. It's astounding. In fact, we met as a preaching team, the, f- the four of us this week, on Thursday morning to pray about this text because I'm preaching it here. Pastor Brian's preaching the same text at our South Street campus and Pastor Sterling at the Mill Creek campus. And we all were remarking how we just feel so inadequate. It's, it would take weeks of sermons. And so we're going to stay till two. <laughs> But I would just say this, the first thing that, jumped, that I, I felt convicted of when I read this prayer over and over again is this. What you pray for and how you pray, says, it, it reveals something about what you really think about God. How you pray, what you pray for reveals something about your relationship with God. The same way when I listened to Pastor Victor pray for me, it was saying something, not just to me, but about that man's relationship with the God to whom he was praying. Your prayers reveal your relationship. If if all you ever pray for is the list of stuff and needs, and of course, you can and you should bring your needs to Christ. But if if it's just always a laundry list of things that you need, that says something, doesn't it, about your relationship? Right away, notice what Paul does not pray for. Paul is writing this letter from prison in Rome. He's under house arrest. He will be under, uh, in a dungeon later on. He's, it's, the, it's the beginning of his imprisonment in Rome. He's in chains, under guard. He's writing to people living in the first century, and they're, they're a minority movement in the Greco-Roman world, often oppressed, persecuted for their faith. He doesn't mention anything about his circumstances or theirs. He does not pray for comfort. He does not pray for security. He does not pray for relief. And it's not wrong to pray for those things, but it's just not what he prays for totally different. What does he pray for? Well, two of the things that jumped out to me are he prays that you'd be filled, right, with the Spirit, and he prays that you would know the love of God. Now, think about that for just a minute. Who's he writing this prayer to? Christians. Church-going Christians in the city of Ephesus, modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor. They're believers in Christ. Didn't Paul already say in chapter 2 that when you trust in Jesus Christ, the Spirit does come into your life? Isn't it true that you can't be a Christian unless you know the love of God in Christ? So why then would Paul pray for them to get stuff they already have? Why does he pray that you'd be filled if you're already filled? Why does he pray that you'd know if you already know? This is really important to understand what he's getting at here. Because there's a huge difference between knowing something intellectually and experiencing its power living out of that knowledge. Paul wants you to know what you know. Do you know? Really. He wants you to know what you know. To get it. To get what you already have. There's a huge difference. And this is absolutely essential to the Christian life. I know There are many of you here who know, but you don't know. I hope I'm not confusing you. (laughs) There are many of you here who intellectually believe God exists and believe Jesus died and rose again, but you don't know it. It doesn't define you. It doesn't fill you. You don't live out of that security and joy. You don't know. Let's look at verses 14 and 15 again. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. Let me stop right there. Now, you might remember last week in, in chapter, uh, verse 1 of chapter 3, Paul begins the same way. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, kneel before the Father. And then he stops and has this little digression on, in which he goes into the mystery of the gospel. Now he gets like back to his prayer, which he started in verse 1. and says, For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derive its name. One of the first things here, this is, this, I'm just call it kneeling before the Father. One of the first lessons of this prayer is the posture, not just physically, but spiritually. If you want to really get 
what you already have in Christ. You need to understand what it means to kneel before the Father. The posture of your heart. Because when Paul says kneel, we think that doesn't sound strange. That doesn't sound unusual. That sounds what you, it's like a, a way of describing prayer, right? Although I would have to, wouldn't you admit that what's the typical way, posture for prayer in our culture? Probably not kneeling. Right, sitting down, heads bowed, hands folded, eyes closed. Nobody peek, right? If you peek, God stops listening. I saw you look. La, 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 la. Like that God's not doing that, right? That's the typical posture for prayer in our culture. Some of us might grew, grew up in a, a culture or tradition where we would kneel, kneelers. But in the tr- first century Jewish culture, out of which the church was birthed, the posture for prayer, the traditional common posture for prayer, was standing with arms raised to heaven. So when Paul says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, he's saying something specific. That posture, at least two things are key about it. One, it's talking about dependency. I I acknowledge that you're God and I'm not. That simple fact, we get reversed in our life. I acknowledge that you're the Father from whom we all get our name, that you're the source of everything in my life. And it's talking about intimacy. Paul says, I kneel before the Father who made us and who knows our names. Dependency and intimacy. Putting your heart in that posture is the first step to knowing, getting what you already have in Christ. Not cowering and fearful like God's going to zap you if you get it wrong. I remember praying with a young man when I was a youth pastor years ago. We would go around and pray in the circle and pray out loud. And that's a hang-up for a lot of people, maybe some of you. And this young man was brand new to faith. He just trusted Jesus, and he, he wanted to pray, but he never really prayed out loud before. And he, he had like three or four false starts. Like, oh, uh, 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 he goes, oh, can I start over? I said, uh, me or God? Yes, you can, right? <laughs> He's worried about, about what? He's worried about how he sounds to all of us. Wrong audience. Sometimes we, we feel that way, right? Like, oh, if I get this wrong, God's going to get me. It's not cowering in fear, but it's humble acknowledgement that I'm not God. I'm totally dependent on him, and I can come to him like a child before his father. Look at verse 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Out of his glorious riches meaning the infinite supply of who God is, he wants to give you strength in your inner being. That, that idea of inner strength is interesting to me. In our culture, inner strength is what? It's something you look down inside of yourself and you muster up, right? I find a source of strength in me I didn't know I had. Have you heard someone talk that way? Like, I, I found out that I was stronger than I thought I was. This inner resolve. That's not at all what Paul's praying for. He said, you can look as far as you want, but you're not going to get in you what I'm praying and asking God to give you. It comes from outside of you. It comes from his spirit in you. Out of his glorious riches, not yours, I pray that you'd be strengthened by his spirit. I mean, this is the kind of supernatural strength in our lives, in our hearts, that we don't find in and of ourselves. You don't muster it up. You don't call it deep from the deep resources of who you are. It must be given to you. And one of my favorite examples of this is an author of, who's a favorite of mine who's not named C.S. Lewis. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, many of you will know his name, was a martyr in Nazi Germany for his faith. He was in Tegel prison uh, in Germany for his part in a plot to, uh, to overthrow Hitler. And he um, was a, kind of a minister to the guards and to the prisoners in that prison. In fact, he led many of the guards to Christ. In fact, we have a book called Letters and Papers from Prison, and the reason we have those letters and papers from prison is because some of the guards that Bonhoeffer led to faith in Christ, who were supposed to keep him in prison, smuggled out his writings so the world would know. One of these guards was so moved by Bonhoeffer's faith and his sense of peace and calm and, and, and joy that he plotted to help him escape. And Bonhoeffer refused to go along with it. He said, because I know that if I was to escape, my mother and my father, my sister and my brother would all pay the price. The SS would come and they would pay for my, if I got out. So he refused. And he was, ended up being executed. Two weeks 
before the Allies came and liberated that part of Germany. Could have got out. I got to be honest, if I was in that prison, I would think that this is a sign from God that this guard wants to get me out. Thank you, Lord. Let's go. He stayed. Where does that inner strength come from? Where does that sense of purpose and, and peace it's not something you find in yourself. Paul says, I pray that out of his riches, he would strengthen you by his spirit. For what purpose? Let's read verse 17 and 18. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. I don't know if you caught this, but as an aside, the Trinity is in Paul's prayer. Some of you might wonder, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the concept is, and, and this is one of the places where it's not often seen, but it's there. He says, I bow my knee before the Father, that he would strengthen you by his Spirit, that you would know the love of his Son, Christ, right? All three. In other words, Paul's saying in this prayer right here, I want the fullness of who God is to be all over your life. Because, friends, it's possible and common to be a Christian and to not have the fullness of who God is in your life. I know something about that. Perhaps you do as well. This is Paul's praying that our hearts would be Christ's home. So Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, he says. The Greek word for dwelling there is the word, it's a, it's a Greek word, ketoikesai, it's fun to say, but it literally means to, uh, to settle in, a permanent dwelling in. It's not a visitor, not, a, not a, 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 like a, a temporary resident. Meaning, let me illustrate it this way. Years ago, I, I used to travel more to do some speaking at like youth camps and youth conferences and retreats and that sort of thing. I do less of it now, just don't have time. But I enjoyed that, being the guest speaker guy on occasion. And sometimes the host church or group would, would put me in a hotel. Sometimes they put me in the resort they were, they were, where the event was. Sometimes they would say, would you like to stay with one of us, meaning like in their home? And the answer to that question was always no, but I never said that because it's rude. <laughs> Because, you know, when you go there, like if you go, do you know what I mean? Like how many of you feel awkward when you're in a home that's not your home and you don't know them very well? I feel terribly un, 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 not at ease. I'm afraid I'm going to break something. I actually did break a chair once <laughs> on a person's porch. That's a, I won't tell that story. <laughs> anyway. But I'm afraid I'm going to break something or I'm going to flush the wrong toilet or clog a toilet or sometimes like the faucet's like in the shower, like, a, like a, just a half a turn is like a million degrees. You know, you don't know, you don't know how to behave in their home. Like what can I eat? What should I not eat? Where should I go? And so I, I didn't like it, but you do it. But when I come into my house, right, it's different. I'm at home. This is my house. I belong here. When Paul says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, he's saying something more than just the objective reality that the that, that Spirit has come into your life, but that he would be at home there. Is Christ at home in your heart, or is he a guest? You've all, we've all got places in our house, right, like a junk drawer or a closet that are kind of off limits to guests. Do you have those? The place when people are coming over, you put all the stuff you don't want them to see? Well, spiritually speaking, if you've got places in your life that are like, okay, you know, Jesus over here is fine, but let's just not, let's stay out of there. Like, let's get that, let, let me get that cleaned up, Jesus, first before I let you in there. What? That's like saying I'll go to the gym once I get in shape. I've tried that, it doesn't work. <laughs> like, the, Paul's saying, I, I want you to be strengthening your inner being by the Spirit. Why? so that Christ could come and be at home in your life, all of your life. If, if you want to know, grasp, get what you already have, brothers and sisters, you gotta let them all the way in. You can't have parts of your life that are like, well, not over here. Because you're basically putting a cap on your experience of the love of God. You're saying, this far, no farther. All I want is this. When you do let him in, the more you let him in, you become what Paul says here in this text. He says, rooted and established. Did you catch those phrases? You being rooted and established in love. Rooted is an agricultural word. Established is an architectural word in Greek. He's saying love is the soil in which you're meant to be planted and rooted. Love is the foundation on which you're to be built. Rooted and established in love. You see the progression here? Strengthen your inner being, the spirit dwelling in you, Christ living in your hearts by faith, so you'd be like deep roots and firm foundation in his love. 
Why? For what purpose? This is in the, verse, the second half of verse 18. That you may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. Scholars debate this. What's the reference? How high, long, wide, and deep is the love of Christ? Some have speculated, perhaps Paul's referring to the tabernacle dimensions of the Holy of Holies, the presence of God, perhaps. Many have said it's the cross, the height and depth and width and breadth of the love of God, and certainly it's a beautiful image. But later on, Paul, in the next verse, will say it's, it's unknowable, it's immeasurable. John Stott puts it this way, the love of Christ is broad enough to encompass all the world, long enough to last for all eternity, deep enough to reach the worst sinner, and high enough to bring us all to himself. He, he's saying, I want you to grasp something that's beyond your power in your human mind to comprehend. When Pastor Victor prayed for me, and I felt that compelling sense of I want more of the love of God that he has, it'd be wrong to make an idol out of him. Oh, I want to be like him. Because what I was sensing from him is, what I think God's saying to me, I have more for you, Jeff. I have more for you. And I think what he's saying to you, you think you grasp how high and long and wide and deep my love is? You don't even know the tiniest fraction. I have more for you. I have more for you. Do you want more? Friends, do you, do you want just a little bit? You got enough of God? I want all I can get. And I want that for you too. How can we know this love of God? How do we know this? I never really paid attention to this before, or at least thought deeply about it. In verse 18, he says, I pray that you, together with all the saints, would have power to grasp how wide, how long, and high, and deep. That phrase, together with all the saints, is very instructive. He's saying, you'll never know the love of God purely on your own. You'll never really get it in isolation. You can get a little bit of it, but you're not going to get what God wants to give you, just you and, and your Bible, just you and Jesus. You need the family. You need other believers. How many of you have ever had the experience where somebody else shares something they saw in God's word or they experienced by God's grace and, it just, and you thought, I never thought of it that way before. That's so encouraging to me. Ever happened to you? Paul's saying together with all the saints. I want you, I know normally in North American churches, you stare straight ahead and I stare at all of you until we're done, then you go home. But take a minute, look around the room. Actually look at people, I know it's awkward for you, but it's fun for me. Turn and look, <laughs> look around the room. Actually turn your heads and look. We're gonna stand here until you do. Right? <laughs> I, I, know, I don't know if you noticed this when you came in, but there's other people here. <laughs> These, the Bible says, are your brothers and sisters, perhaps weird uncles and strange aunts, but, you know, family members. And, and Paul is serious when he says, you can't know the love of God the way you, he wants you to know it without them. Without them. They have something of the love of God that you need, and you have something of the love of God that they, you have perspectives that each other, you, the love of God is so vast that how could you possibly know it on your own? C.S. Lewis writes about this in a book called An Experiment in Criticism, the lesser known of his books. He says, my own eyes are not enough. I would see through a myriad eyes. I wish I could see through the eyes of a gnat, he said. I want to experience the world. He goes, I regret that dogs can't write books. I want to know what they smell, right? His point is, I want to know the world through the eyes of others because that makes me more myself. I get more of it. If that's true about just life and literature, how tr much more true is it of God? We live in a culture where religion is your private business. You know, you keep it to yourself. Apostle Paul says, I want you to get something that you don't get. And you're not going to get it on your own. You need each other. Where are we? I'm asking you. I don't know. <laughs> Let's read verse 19. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This, if there's a, if there's a crux of the prayer, it's this. I want you to be strengthened in your inner being out of his glorious riches, that the Spirit would fill you, that Christ would dwell in you, that you'd be rooted and established in love, that you begin to grasp, just glimpse the immeasurable greatness of his love. Why? So you'd be filled. Filled. Filled with the fullness of God's love. Sometimes you read this and you think like, okay, filled, like how full? Like do some people have the Spirit to their knees, some people to their chests, some people to their nose, some of you are overflowing? Like what does it mean? 
The word filled in Greek doesn't mean like fill like you fill a pitcher. It means controlled by. Think about it this way. If you're full of anger, you're controlled by it, aren't you? If you're full of greed, you're controlled by it, aren't you? If you're full of bitterness over what was done to you in the past, you're controlled by that. So Paul says, I want you to be filled with what? The fullness of who God is. The, the depth of his love. To be controlled by it. Jonathan Edwards, in his book, A Divine and Supernatural Light, says, you can know about the sweetness of honey from a book. You can read about it. You can study honey's beautiful amber color and texture. But you don't know its sweetness till you what? Taste it. There's a whole different thing. You can study it. You can examine it. You can read about it. You can understand the chemical properties of sugar. But you're never going to know its sweetness until you, its true sweetness until you taste it. This is why the psalmist says, taste and see. Taste and see? No, right? Fully know that God is good. That's what Paul's praying for us here. Filled up to the measure of all the fullness of God. Overflowing. So what's our response then to this? In a word, worship. To worship. Listen to how Paul concludes in verse 20 through 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power at work within us. I'm going to pause there for just a minute. Now, some, I've heard this so abused by pastors and preachers and writers. They, they write this as if it means this. God can do more than you could even imagine. And you think, hey, I can imagine quite a lot. I can imagine being a lot wealthier than I am. I can imagine being a lot more successful than I am. So God can do more than that. That's awesome. As if God's going to do more on your terms. That c destroys what he's been saying, isn't it? What is the whole point of Paul's prayer? Did he ever talk about riches or wealth or prosperity or getting out of bad circumstances prior to this? What is the more? When he says God can do, he who is able to do immeasurably more, what's the more? It's not a trick question. More of his love. More of what he's been praying for. For example, if you are ever caused to doubt. Yeah, that's fine, Jeff, in theory, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what's happened to me in my life. You're right, I don't, but God does. And he's able to do immeasurably more. He's able to forgive more than you can imagine. He's able to bless more than you can imagine. He's able to overcome more than you can imagine. Whatever your hang-up is about God's love, he is able to do more, immeasurably more. Friends, there's nothing more important. There's nothing more important in your life than for you to know that you're loved by God. It's such a simple thing, but I, it's hard enough to love people, isn't it? I mean, maybe your family, you're pretty good at it, but I'm guessing it's hard to love people. I, for me, it's harder to be loved. How many would agree with that? Because deep down inside, we go, I don't know if I'm worthy. My friends, there's nothing more important in your life than to know that you're loved by God. Paul writes that you would know what you know. Do you know? He wants you to be filled to the fullness of God, overflowing, controlled by, defined by his love. That prayer moment in Russia many years, 16 years ago, was just a taste. And I would tell you today, I know more than I did then, but I still don't know. I want to know, and I want you to know. God wants you to know how loved you are. Let's pray. Father, we, we just pause now and acknowledge that we're pretty small-minded people. Most of the time, we're, our, our thoughts and our, our concerns are dealing with just the events of our daily lives. We're stressed out, anxious, fearful. We acknowledge you are so much greater that your love is beyond knowing and yet you call us to know it, to experience it, to live in it. Only by your spirit in us can we know the unknowable, the height and depth and length and breadth of your love. For many people here, God, I know that they are struggling with this, that they feel unworthy or undeserving or unloved. I pray with the Apostle Paul that out of your glorious riches, you would strengthen them in their inner being through your spirit 
so that Christ would dwell in their hearts through their faith in you. And that in that, they'd be rooted and established in your love. And that together with all the people who love you in their life, they would be able to grasp the immeasurable greatness of your love in Christ and filled to the measure of all the fullness of who you are. That's what you want for us. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.